Hi everyone, hello, welcome. We are so, so, so happy, so, so, so excited to see so many people, 210 participants and counting. It has been a very big rise. So welcome everyone uh, to our session, uh, to our youth town hall, UNDP and youth, our accountability to future generations. We are more than excited to welcome you all today. So I've seen already on the chat that we have people from Cambodia, China, Pakistan, India, Philippines, Vietnam, pretty much everywhere in the region. Also some friends from Nigeria, from Sudan. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, we have youth from all around the world. We are so, so, so happy. So please keep the messages coming. Please keep sharing on the chat where you are calling from. It can be your city, it can be your country. In the meantime, uh, let me introduce a bit myself uh, and frame a bit the session for the next few minutes uh, before, we, before we start all the activities. But hi everyone, bonjour, uh, xin chào. My name is Dean Long, it's a Vietnamese name, but I was born and raised in Paris, France. And uh, I work with, uh, I've been working with UNDP for the last two years for the youth engagement and youth empowerment programs. And I'll be one of your facilitator, one of your MC for the day. I will be doing that along with my amazing colleague, Arati Krishnan. So maybe Arati, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, so thrilled to be here. My name is Arati Krishnan. Um, I've been, I'm the strategic advisor for Foresight uh, for UNDP Asia Pacific and really thrilled to be supporting this wonderful effort uh, with Dinlong and Savi and, and the rest of their amazing team. Back to you, Dinlong. Thank you so much, Arati. So, Okay, I think there's so many messages on the chat, it's impossible to read everything, but yeah, you come from pretty much every country in the region. Uh, let's see if you are as excited as I am. So let's say from one to 10, 10 being the highest number, what is your current level of excitement? 10 is you are super excited, you want to jump everywhere. One is maybe you need some coffee, you need a power nap after the session, of course. So I see someone, it says 1 billion. So it's very, that's a lot of excitement. Uh, okay, everyone is at eight, nine, 10. It cannot be measured. Okay, so <laughs> the excitement counter is gonna explode. Uh, so we are very happy. And maybe before, um, to explain a bit the context of why we are having this session today, um, maybe some of you have joined uh, the World We Want consultation that we were having earlier this year. But yes, this year UNDP was developing its strategic document for 2022-2025 and wanted to engage youth and include the youth voices in, a, in the document in an authentic manner, in a meaningful way. And that's why we held uh, 17 uh, youth consultations that we call the world we want. And we held them all around Asia Pacific. Today, you will also hear from Xiaotong and Prajesh, who had a key role in organizing these uh, consultations. And it's really on top of one thing we are really proud of, on top of uh, youth gathering and connecting and providing insights about what, how do they see the future? How do they see the future of the world? And how do they see the future of UNDP and the world of UNDP as well? We saw youth connecting, youth inspiring each other, youth telling us that they were so inspired to take action for the future they want, youth that told us that they reassess their goals after the World We Want consultations, youth who told us that they understood that they had a role to play in this dialogue between UNDP and young people. So we are extremely happy about it. And today's session is really a key milestone, a next step after all this World We Want consultation in order to introduce a bit about the key findings and introduce a bit, continue the, the dialogue between how UNDP can meaningfully engage with young people in the region. So a lot of activities are planned today. Uh, once I'm done speaking, um, you'll have opening remarks from uh, Ms. Kani Rinyaraja, who is um, the U, uh, Assistant Secretary General, uh, Assistant Administrator, and also uh, Director of uh, the Regional Bureau for Asia and Pacific. After that, you will hear uh, also the opening remarks from Prajesh and Xiaotong, who are two amazing youth community builders with the Movers program. And then we'll move into the Ask Me Anything session, where you will be able to ask Kenny all the questions that you want related to 
UNDP and Youth Meaningful Engagement. We are on a Zoom call, so just quickly feel free to react at any time on the Zoom chat. Ask your question on the Zoom chat, react with the Zoom. You can uh, clap, you can uh, give some hearts, so feel free to do that throughout the session. It's how we know that it's interactive and the interactiveness also depends on you in the end. So please uh, see that as a big movers workshop, you can uh, be as interactive as you want. So thank you so much. That was a bit to frame the session and now we'll kickstart everything. We hope that you enjoy the session. All will be well and I'll pass it to you, Arati, for the next section. Great, thanks so much, Din Long. Uh, just to say uh, the Movers uh, program and the World We Want uh, consultations were fantastic. It really highlighted, and as Din Long said, what we wanted was to ensure that we were engaging with young people in a very authentic, non-tokenistic way to inform what we were learning and hearing from the regional, uh, for the regional strategy for, for Asia Pacific. Um, so I'm thrilled now um, to hand over to, to our Assistant Secretary General, uh, Kani Raja, for her comments, opening comments. Um, we get to do this because of our leadership support, because we get um, the support and and the backing from our leadership to say, yes, go out and do this. So um, thrilled to have Kani here with us in, in the middle of an incredibly busy, stressful week. Um, and so over to you, Kani. Thank you very much, uh, Arti and uh, Ding Long. And how wonderful to, uh, to be here with, uh, with all of you. Um, I really want to say that, uh, you know, this is, uh, let me start right up front saying that uh, this is the, What's going on right now in, um, in our region, certainly, and, and what I'm dealing with uh, right now, uh, which um, for the last, um, I would say, four or five days has been almost um, totally uh, the situation in Afghanistan. And this is not the world we want, right? So it brings us um, to uh, a point uh, of saying, uh, you know, we shouldn't be as a generation of, um, of human beings. Um, we shouldn't be allowing uh, things like this to happen to any part uh, of our uh, community. And so it is um, deeply important to me uh, that uh, we hear from you um, on um, things that can right our world. You know, we've um, in so many places on so many things um, we've messed up and it's not just uh, the previous uh, generation, it's the generation before uh, and before that, you know, we've had uh, conflicts and wars and uh, we've not uh, taken care of our environment uh, or each other um, for so long. And, um, but each time I, I'm a born optimist, uh, like I know uh, most of you are. And um, the light that shines through is that you know you are part of the, it's, this is the world's largest generation of young people, right, in our history. And, um, you know, if you ask me, what are we to do with that information, with that fact? Uh, it's 1.8 billion young people just in our region, right? Um, between ages of, of 10 to 24. Um, and it's to try to write some of this stuff going on. Um, the conflicts, the, um, the inability to, to change our behavior, uh, to protect our climate and environment. Um, to, um, so in some places, the inability to change our behavior, even with COVID, which is now a living uh, pandemic. Um, in, in other places, the, um, the injustices, um, the, the lack of dignity and, and voice. Um, and it gives me a moment um, when I've been kind of um, discussing with uh, our Afghan uh, colleagues uh, and our stakeholders right now. Um, there, is, uh, there is always that immediate worry um, for, for life and, and livelihoods, but I think the, the larger 
uh, worry that stays and is generational is that hopes and dreams, particularly of girls and young women, are being dashed, right? And the world, this is not about Afghanistan alone nor about Myanmar or, or many other places. I feel we have, there is a collective responsibility and this large group of young people, the movers, the dreamers, the change makers, the, the people who will innovate, who have the ideas, um, do have to shake the trees, right? It doesn't mean the older generation can just abrogate our responsibilities and now just say, well, get on with it, it's yours. I mean, that used to irritate me when I was uh, younger, so I won't do that uh, to you today. I think it is a shared sense of things that we have to do, but we've got to have a, a sense of a shared vision, right? A shared dream and behind that to say, no one's gonna take this away from us. Um, and that's why to me, this conversation is not just about the UNDP regional program, right? It's what we can do and we will use that program. We'll use this, this platform. Uh, to listen to, to see where can we take that sense of purpose, uh, that um, the intentionality that we're not going to just stand by and, and let this, uh, just these things go on. Um, we have to do something different. And we've had amazing consultations and conversations in, in almost all our countries in the region. And if I had to summarize a, um, a word, a single word, right, that comes out uh, through what all of you are saying, no matter what country you're from or what community you are from, uh, it's the word inclusion. You are constantly saying there is no point in having discussions just with those you are comfortable having the same old conversations with. You've got to bring more folks in with different backgrounds, different opinions, um, to have that more inclusive uh, sense of where we are headed, even whether it's on COVID recovery, whether it's on the digital world, it, whether it's on the future of work, uh, the future of our economies that just can't uh, pretend that hurting the climate is okay, um, the future of our societies. Um, and the fact that we have to, the way we have to bring, do this together, the together has to include more people who are not alike. Uh, and that to me is, is so critical. And I'm so happy that our youth collab, our youth focal points in our, in our country offices, uh, together with all of you, uh, are taking ownership of this process and, and getting more people uh, involved. So you're practicing uh, what you are preaching of trying not to leave people behind. Now, the what I want to add is a second word. And I know it's there. I just would like it to pop out more. And I want to hear from you uh, also on this, which is empathy. Because you need empathy to deeply understand differences and to be okay with differences. And again, I think uh, there is a generational shift because we don't have enough empathy in the world today. We wouldn't be seeing what's going on in Afghanistan if there was more empathy. And if people um, you know, were allowed to be uh, who they want to be, and as long as they're not hurting anyone, and in fact, quite the contrary, by allowing people to be who they are and realize their full potential, it is the world we want. So that's my, my big ask of you is yes, we need the new ideas, but we also need new ways of working together, of approaching these challenges, um, of sharing and building those bridges. Because without that, we can't take things to scale. So even if we have 200 plus colleagues, of, and all of you on this call, that's just not enough, right? It, 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 to allow that to bubble 
and to connect the dots and to make it a movement of change, it needs the, both the inclusion and the empathy. And so I hope with that, that we design things differently together. And we take all those ideas, but we also speak very deeply to the how we need to move uh, forward. Uh, and we always look out uh, for those that have less opportunity, less access, who are more scared uh, than we are of what the future holds and try and address that first uh, and bring them together in that conversation. So thank you so much for, for being here um, with us. Uh, and I look forward to, to listening to you and to engaging uh, with you. So Arti, back to you. Thank you so much, Kani. Thank you so much, Kani. Um, in, uh, Empathy, uh, I think, is really resonating with all of us here. The the ability to listen here and be okay and sit with difference. Um, thank you for those those really warm opening remarks, uh, Dinlong. Back to you now. Uh, we're going to hear from two of our incredible movers that facilitated very large consultations uh, in their countries, um, and so Dinlong will now introduce um, those two uh, wonderful people. Thank you, Arati. Thank you so much, Kenny. And yes, yeah, speaking of inclusion and empathy, I would like to invite Xiaotong and Prajesh, who are for me the epitome of people who fight for inclusion and empathy uh, with the Movers program and throughout their daily life. Uh, so they will, they have, be, they had a key role in the World We Want consultations, leading the consultations respectively in China and Nepal. So it's my pleasure. Uh, to invite Xiaotong first uh, to take the floor. If there is any, for all the movers in the call today, please make some noise for Xiaotong and for Pradesh. And Xiaotong, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And good evening to all the youth and good morning to Mr. Kami. And I'm Xiaotong, a movers community builder in China. And, I, and I'm also a part of organizing team from the World We Want organization in China. In my own experience, many young people feel that SDGs are far from our real daily life and we don't have enough power to contribute to any SDGs. Mm, I think the reason is that we feel there is a distance between youth and UNDP and we cannot find a suitable place for us to share. But the world we want consultation gives us a platform to express our views on an equal level. During the consultation, participants came from a variety of backgrounds, including university students, successful entrepreneurs, transgenders, and youth with disabilities. We all came together in the name of SDGs and the future of UNDP without any discrimination or prejudice. We showed our respect and encouragement for each other. We felt very safe to share what we want in mind. During the consultation, we heard and communicate about a wider range of social issues. I was able to understand how 17 SDG goals related to our real life and what it means to us. And it's making me feel inspired to work for a better world. Let's use empowered youth. Involving youth into UNDP decision-making should not just be a tokenist way. UNDP needs to do something which can allow youth to know our value and the strengths during these activities. The World We Want consultation and the Movers program generally allowed me to connect it with my peers and young entrepreneurs to take some actions. The way that UNDP did through the consultation let youth empower a small group of youth and youth can empower more youth around the world. Leave no one behind. That is what I think the world we want consultation enabled. 
giving all people the same right to be heard. Through 17 the World We Want consultation, organized with the, the support of 50 youth leaders, for four of 700 youth participants in Asia Pacific. I'd like to thank UNDP and the Movers Program for providing this opportunity to us. More and more youth communities are trying to learn about the differences between um, our life and UNDP and the uh, Movers Program has made to our life. I hope that in the future, our youth can join us to be a giver, a motivator, and a leader. Thank you for listening. Now I give this to Prajesh. Thank you. Thank you, Sao Tong. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for organizing this town hall today. I'm Prajesh Khanal. I'm a youth community builder with the Movers program, and I led the organizing team of the World We Want consultations back in Nepal. It's my absolute pleasure speaking with you all today. Let me begin with uh, remembering the World We Want consultations. I remember the World We Want consultations were a unique consultation indeed. What was unique is youth from different backgrounds were brought together and we could collectively discuss our hopes, our futures, our worries. The best thing I like, everyone could join regardless of their uh, background, their experience, and it was totally led by youth. I felt that it differed from other consultations uh, because most of the times we are on with a lot of formality and we could actually keep the formalities aside and discuss and make it a safe space, so safe that we could discuss things that are even considered taboo in the society. We even questioned and discussed uh, if UNDP is relevant and the role of UNDP in today's world. Uh, when I was inviting youth for the World We Want workshops, most of the people asked me, why is this happening? When I replied that uh, UNDP is asking for youth inputs, UNDP wants youth inputs to their strategy, there was a similar thing I got from so many youth. The question was, UNDP wants us to speak, but does UNDP really want to listen to us? So this comes from what we experience. Most of the time what happens is young people's participation in policy making, it starts with young people sharing their ideas, their inputs, their hopes, but uh, it ends on the same point. So we, we as young people, we in this call today have participated in numerous consultations and we have provided input so many places. But when it comes to translation of our voices into the actual policy, there's a big gap. And today that proper translation of our voices is what we ask for and what we expect with UNDP. As the Assistant Secretary General just said, Asia Pacific indeed is one of the most youthful regions in the world. And we have been hearing this time and again, youth are the future. Yes, we indeed are the future, but we are not just the pillars of future, we are the stakeholders of today too. And I'm speaking for all youth in this call today when I say that it is time we break this glass ceiling, this invisible ceiling that is stopping us from being acknowledged as present and pushing us just for the future. And I also know that it's not only you who should be breaking the glass ceiling. I don't uh, say it's only UNDP or our governments to break this. It's us to we too, but it requires us to be empowered. It requires us to at least be aware of things that are going around, right? And those things should be equally accessible to those youth who are from the rural parts of our region, who are from the most underrepresented communities. Today, we just don't want spaces where we can voice our opinions. We want those platforms where we can learn, we can unlearn, relearn, lead, express. I'd like to emphasize this. UNDP has all the resources which can make this happen. Please make it happen. With today, with change in time, how we are addressing youth engagements, we are seeing a sharp rise in tokenism and a lot of youth washing. Time is changing and the thought processes of young people are changing. 
I believe we really need to reimagine and update the contemporary approaches we have to youth engagement to youth participation. I'm so happy this time to see the change in uh, with the World We Want consultations. You know, I compared it to the previous consultations I have participated in, and I, I believe uh, the UNDP team has seen the differences to the outcomes they have got from youth in the previous things versus uh, the world we want. I believe uh, it was a commendable start. There is no doubt in it, as we got to hear voices of so many youths whose voices might not have come out if, if we had gone through the traditional ways. However, we still missed many young people. So many young people was leading the movement of change in, in the grassroots level, in the ruralist part of, of our region who might have more clear ideas, who might have more concise ideas of what's going around them in their communities. I today call and expect UNDP to further systematize, enhance and extend uh, such processes to not only the country level, but to the local levels. So we really can leave no one behind and have all those voices come to the mainstream from their grassroots. I can, I can say this, hearing from the Assistant Secretary General today has made me a lot hopeful. And I wish uh, thoughts like hers would sprout more in the UNDP and around, and we could actually imagine the world we want in reality. Lastly, uh, the world we want might be ambitious. I, I agree, it might be ambitious, but it's not utopian at all. We young people anticipate how you will lead us to the world we want. And we young people are ready to hold hand in hand with you to work to actually make it happen. Are you ready to bring us together and work with us? Thank you for the time. Giving the floor back to Ms. Arati Kristen. Thank you, uh, both, both of you, for such amazing, impassioned uh, voices. We hear it. it um, I remember having the first original uh, conversation and brainstorm with Savi and Ben and, and Din Long talking about how we wanted this to be different, and it amazed all of us. Uh, how inclusive this program was when they ran it out. Um, and it was absolutely fantastic, fantastic. And we wanted to get the momentum going. We also really wanted, as you said, for to really reimagine how we use content um, to not just be a line in a strategy that says, you know, youth consultations did this, but to actually inform what we do. So we're hearing you loud and clear. I'm going to stop talking because I'm very conscious about time. Um, and I want to hand back, I'm going to, uh, Din Long, if this is okay with you, we're going to go straight to opening up some Q&A. Um, if you have some questions in, uh, for Kani, please post that into the chat. Um, we do have one that we're going to get started with Kani. It's a bit of a tough one, um, but I'm going to post that to you. It comes from, let me get this right, from Anup Kumar Chak Chakrabarti. Will world political leaders provide extended help at UNDP initiatives to make progress for future generations? We fail to see this positive mindset in leaders currently. How do you observe this, uh, Ms. Kani? Um, that's our first question. Um, and we've got a few more coming in. Uh, Din Long and I are going to take some turns uh, going back and forth with this. But um, yeah, that's, that's a tough one to begin with, Kani, but I'm sure you can handle that. Uh, over to you. Well, let me say, and, and uh, first, I do want to also just comment on, on both what uh, uh, Tang and uh, Prajesh just said, uh, and very well uh, stated to us. Um, I think, you know, two things that really um, uh, resonated with me uh, in terms of how to close some of the distance, right, that uh, that young people feel uh, that Shao Tang spoke to and um, projects your issue of um, how UNDP can be more relevant today in today's world. This is, you know, it's important to first look at self, right, before trying to see how to change the world. If we can't change ourselves, what's the point? And to me, one of the things that comes out uh, very strong, if we are to move from these forever consultations to, to taking some of these, because with um, ideas has to come also the wisdom to translate those ideas, right? So we can't let me be very, um, very uh, open here. We can't expect that just because we stated an idea that the rest of the world is going to get excited, including all these world leaders that I would like to also talk about uh, and say, oh, let's make that a policy, right? 
Um, not even my teenage children believe that. Um, so, and you all are older than that, right? So the issue is how do you take good ideas and really uh, push them, shove them, pummel them, test them, so that we can show and demonstrate that these ideas are worthy of changing policies, national plans, budgets, right? At the end of the day, the issue is how do you put um, also money behind, national budgets behind some of these good ideas? So it never goes from, oh, I had an idea to saying, whoa, look at this big national plan that, that now I have influenced. And I think that's the space uh, that I would like us to come in on, right? And, and, and not just say, oh, we heard you, because then you have the right to say, well, excuse me, so what do you do about that? Then we can say, well, we are workshopping these ideas, we're testing them, we're trying to put them into our programs, and 90% of them are not going to go anywhere. That's just a rule of thumb, right? I mean, just think of yourself as a, as a scientist in a lab, when you, you know, in grade 10, those labs we were put into, most of the experiments don't work, but 10% will work. And that's then what we take on and we must do something about it. It's so important to be able to have those spaces to test some bold, brave ideas and help to make them work. So I really hope that that, and that's something I'm pushing my team and that y'all will keep pushing us to make that happen. Now, if I come to that question that, that was asked, this is a tough one. I mean, I am not seeing today and I am again, I get out of bed every morning because I'm an idealist and I keep believing that every day will be better than the day before. Right. And as I said, right now, I am terribly, sadly influenced with what is going on in Afghanistan. So it's not a good day to ask me, what do you think of our leaders in the region and the world? Because it's I'm just not in a good place, if I might just share that with you um, in thinking, wow, there's hope. Right. And um, but tomorrow I will feel better because I would have heard from you and you would have inspired and motivated me because a number of folks like you will become leaders uh, of different things of uh, uh, you all will be entrepreneurs, you will be scientists, you will, you will in different ways uh, take that on. Now, this is not to say that all our current leaders uh, are a useless lot. We have some amazing leaders out there. And I think till we sit in those shoes, we never understand the huge um, power plays and the, the tough choices that have to be made. It's very easy always to sit from the outside and say, oh, the, these leaders really don't know what they're doing till you sit in those shoes, right? So. I, I keep trying to understand sometimes when I see a really, what I think is an awful, awful choice or decision, I think, what is it? Because these were young people at some point. These were idealists. They were you and I, right? So what got them to this place uh, where it is a horrendous set of decisions for countries, for communities, as I said right now, for young girls and women? Uh, where hope is being removed. But we have amazing young Afghans who are not going to give up. We have amazing young people. When I look at the chat from where all of you are, uh, you will not give up, even in a moment where you think, why is this happening in my community or in my country? You won't give up. And that's what I want to say, that with leaders, what we have to do is we have to keep going on uh, at them so that they realize that there's a large group of people uh, who are a power base, uh, who think uh, in the positive, who think it is important uh, to change the way, the trajectories that we are on. So I still believe that we can influence and if uh, we uh, bring our powers together, this is a, a group of Avengers that uh, can, can change the
the way things are. Arti, back to you and, and Ding Long. Thank you so much, Kenny, for all the words of encouragement for all the youth. And maybe to dive deeper into what you said, how can youth become, keep being positive, optimistic, idealist? Uh, there was a great question from Charles uh, slash Carlos. Uh, but maybe instead of asking it myself, I'd like to ask Charles uh, whether you'd like you'd like maybe to unmute and ask your question directly um, to Kenny. Uh, okay, uh, Charles is my English and French name, and Carlos is my Spanish name. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so I would like to ask Miss Kenny on the background of anti globalization. Uh, globalization, there are fewer and fewer exchanges among countries, brought by the rise, rise of populism in various countries, oppositions to go globalization and cooperation, and some and even some tendencies of extreme nationalism and fascism, which leads to the young people in each country more or less um, hostile to other countries. How can we break this? Uh, hostility and promote better exchanges and cooperation among young people around the world. Thank you so much. Uh, do you mind if I jump in on that? I think, I mean, it's a, it's such a relevant issue of our times, right? So Carlos, thank you for that. And, you know, I have, um, from the day I remember, to me, this issue of nationalism and um, um, you know the the need to is comes from a need somehow to protect a single identity, right? And that always says there has to be others. There have to be those who are not you, and therefore have you have to protect your your space. So. To, to me, there's lots of words we, we can use for this, but it's, a, it's a, the complete antithesis of what we want, right? Which is to open the spaces, to say, to embrace our differences. And whether that's sexual identity uh, and gender, whether that's um, ethnic and religious identities, the, the world has space for everyone. And it's, it's such... Um, you know, it, it hurts every time when we try and close these spaces and say, you don't belong in that space. And that is, um, and you, it doesn't mean that one can't be proud of um, a, a community identity or a, a religious identity or a national identity, uh, but why does one have to exclude others who also want to be proud of their identities. And that is a, there's somehow, unfortunately, you know, we have these fundamental uh, parts of our being uh, that are always at contradiction with each other. Um, human nature is such that we, we want to, there's a, the good part, if I might call it that, wants to embrace other human beings in their whole, right? And uh, the worst part of us uh, wants to exclude because of power, we want to hold that power in, in our selective uh, identity. And so what you have put your, your finger on, Carlos, is to me, a, 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 and you know, I, I, if I had to put a third word with inclusion and empathy, it's this, this issue of identity. And instead of seeing ourselves as a global citizen, Right, that should protect each other, protect um, the, the ability for everyone to thrive, and that there's big enough a space to do that. Uh, and I come back then to the previous issue of world leaders. To me, the world leaders who have sh truly shown, just think in your mind, if you had one or two or three world leaders who you think in history were amazing, the reason I would posit that certainly I feel um, the reason I put them at a higher level and say these are the inspiring people uh, is because their sense of identity was so embracing and so large. So I hope that each one of you, no matter what space you choose to hold, 
that that is central for you, that you never exclude because someone else identified with something different, as long as it does not harm someone else. That to me is the bottom line, right? If, if you should embrace all identities as long as they are not harmful to someone else. Back to you. Uh, thank you, Connie. We have uh, quite a few questions related to identity, to LGBTIQ groups, etc. But I think your response has quite has covered it quite um, thoroughly. I'm going to now ask our colleagues from. We've got Jenny Kolster Lager from the Swedish Embassy. Um, Jenny, did you want to ask your question uh, with relation to how UNDP can work with donors to ensure meaningful youth engagements? Or I can ask that for you. But let me hand over to Jenny to see if she wants to ask this question directly. Yes, good, uh, good evening. And thank you very much for a very interesting and inspiring seminar. No, I think you, you actually asked my question. I was just wondering along the line working together how, what do you see as the most burning gaps in the Asia Pacific region and how can we fill those gaps together? Thanks, Jenny. I think I'd like to go back to the issue of moving some of these ideas into how we can demonstrate them in practice. And that doesn't, that doesn't come, I mean, love and fresh air is not going to do that, right? So we need the partnerships, we need the resources to be able to test this. And there are only a few partners who are willing to take the risk of not everything working, right? So let's say we take 10 ideas, right? And we say we're going to actually try these out. Um, and as I said, eight may fail. And we've got to be brave enough to say that's okay because we've tried and tested them. And now let's take the two that work and really put our effort behind it. And that takes political support. It takes a range of partnerships. It takes money. Uh, it takes changing institutions. And it takes a lot of capable people like we have on this call. So, there are some areas I think we've got to be so much more aggressive on climate action. We cannot wait, right? Remember, I mean, this amazing report, I, I haven't read the 4,500 pages of it, uh, but uh, colleagues have delightfully uh, provided a, a 30, 40 page summary. But um, if you look at that, right, we know even if we do all the right things on protecting our climate, the, the shift will only happen to a better moment at 2050. And by the way, I wanted to say to Prajes, I never use the term youth uh, holds the future. I always speak to holding it today. There are no point, the future is gonna be an awful place if we don't make the change today. So it belongs to us today, to you, to me, to all of us, right? So it's, um, the, that area. The second is to me, the and particularly during COVID, the gains we had on gender, and I'm talking here women and, and, and young girls, it has dropped back so far. In every country in our region, every country, even the, the best high income countries, women are not at this and girls are not at the same status and do not have the same opportunities as boys and men. This is a reality, right? So that's another area where you cannot take the attention off or the foot off the pedal. That's for, for sure. Then look at the ethnic, religious, um, sexual uh, identity uh, that are discriminated against. Um, and so again, we're leaving a huge number of people behind. And then some colleagues talked about those who are out of sight because of geography. We're not even getting to some of the remote rural areas. Now, let me again be very practical about this. In our programs, it costs a whole lot more to go deeply remote via geography. It, does, it just does. 
So I don't want us to be um, blind to the fact that it doubles the budget if you want to actually even hear the voices uh, in remote areas, because there is not easy digital and virtual access. So you have to physically get there. You have to take along those who can speak in the different languages, understand the cultures. It costs a whole lot more. So I also want us, while we must remain idealistic, I want us to be wise in saying, how do we really do this without just putting out a whole lot of ideas that then folks who do then uh, make the choices uh, on some of these budgets and programs say, but that's just not real, that's not practical. And this is where Jenny, I think uh, bringing in those spaces uh, to test some of these and help to scale some of these ideas where the biggest gaps are, this is critical. So I hope not just Sweden, but a whole lot of our partners stay with us uh, on this course. Back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Kani. And for the next question, we are moving a bit uh, the category, but there it's a question about your own journey um, at UNDP. So what uh, is the most unforgettable and greatest experience when you are working with UNDP for so many years? And also what made you stay, right? What is your big vision, your big mission that you have uh, staying with UNDP? So I, you know, I have to say I hadn't intended, I mean, I have, this is my 30th year, straight out of grad school um, into, into UNDP. And a uh, couple of things, um, I in every country, and it's because it, with UNDP, you can serve in different countries, right? I keep meeting the most amazing people. I, it's, um, it's a privilege uh, to, to be able to do one small little bit um, and not just uh, help to influence and be there for, for people who really need us, but to gain so much from those insights. So every time, um, whether it was in Vietnam, uh, in Indonesia, in Zambia, wherever I served, um, I always think I learned more and took more than I gave, um, but I hope I left a little something uh, behind. And it, it was always what inspired me that there are in every country, in every community. And in these countries, I traveled across the countries. Um, and I always met people who had hope and who were doing amazing things, not just talking about hope, but actually translating hope. Um, and when I think when I first joined, remember it was uh, AIDS that was decimating our world. It was a pandemic. We don't talk about it as a pandemic and hopefully soon, we won't talk about COVID as a pandemic, but we've learned to live with HIV. Uh, and, but at that time we had no idea what it was. And some of us, I was in my early twenties. Uh, we just with a notepad and a pen because we had no uh, laptops and, and, uh, and notepad, notebooks at the time, we had actual physical paper. We went village to village asking about the experience of HIV and what we could do and how we could address it and what would not make the world scared about HIV. So they didn't stigmatize those with HIV. And that's to me, I hope that experience and that's why I brought that with me uh, from that age throughout that if we understand each other better, we won't stigmatize, we won't be scared of each other. We will be able to support each other better. Um, and so that was a very um, early uh, experience. Um, and then, you know, my first uh, field posting was in, in Vietnam. And uh, that, my goodness, I mean, I couldn't have asked to, to be in a, in a place that opened my eyes to the fact that if you believe in something so strongly, you will fight the world powers to protect it. And that's what I learned from Vietnam, um, that um, you can, you know, if the, it, it was a country that believed so much uh, in what it stood for, 
that it would take on all of these world leaders and world powers and much more sophisticated armies uh, and all the bombers in the in the world could not stop that, right? So these are moments when you you step back and think we can do it. Uh, we can do it today uh, against uh, a lot of these things that are being thrown at us uh, if we believe and we stick together. Back to you, Ding Long. Uh, thank you so much, Kani. Um, we want to ensure that we're going to finish on time today. Um, and there are so many incredible questions in the chat that we're just not going to have time to, to get through. We want to respect um, Kani. And also, we've got Swarnam, our chief economic advisor, on the call with us. So what we're going to do is we're going to wind up the Q&A now. We're going to hand over to Swarnam, our chief economic advisor for UNDP Asia Pacific. We will be sending, we will be uh, curating all these questions and the team will curate the responses to them and we'll be emailing them out. So please be assured that we're not losing the thread. Uh, we're monitoring it and, and, and we will get back to everybody with your wonderful um, queries and curiosities and challenges uh, to UNDP. But for now, um, I'm thrilled to hand over to Swarnim Wagle uh, just for a few closing comments um, and then we will wind up. Thank you. Thank you, Arati. It's wonderful to join you all. You know, I call myself a former young person. Many people see, still see me as a young, young um, economist. Uh, in my country, for example, I'm always introduced as a young economist. But I, I, you know, relative to you, I'm a former young person. But it's wonderful to join you all, and uh, the energy and the 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 um, the ideas. Uh, uh, the demands that you've made, uh, you know, the positions that you've uh, asserted, it's really, really uh, good. And, and, and Kani has covered uh, uh, almost all of the issues uh, very thoroughly. Uh, you know, as an economist, I always start with a fact, right? That motivates me, that inspires me, that, uh, you know, is a call for an action. So in the Asia Pacific, we, we say it's a young, young region and, and some sub-regions are younger than others. And we take this as a, as a you know, we take a median age as a reference. Uh, but what is striking for me relative to other countries that have um, uh, graduated or that, that have become richer uh, than most parts of Asia Pacific is this transition period from an easing society to an aged society. And here the numbers are really striking, right? So easing society, you know, you have this cutoff of around 7% um, uh, of the population in your country that is above the age of 65. And then uh, aged societies when, when you reach 14%. So how long does it take for a society to go from that 7% above 65 to 14% above 65? Uh, and you take into account fertility rates, birth rates, morbidity, mortality, et cetera. And this is you know, where the demo demographers are, are at work. Now in Vietnam, uh, the aging uh, clock started in 2016. It will end in 2034. That's you have 18 years of period where you go from that relatively young society to a relatively uh, older society. South Korea and Singapore, that window is already shut, right? So they had a period of around 20 years from uh, 1998, 99, and then that, sh that was shut around this time, 2019, 2020. Uh, Thailand and China are also, you know, have had that 20 to 22 year period. Uh, Japan, uh, the most advanced country in our region started in 1970 and their door shut in 1994. So they had basically 24 year period. Indonesia, Nepal, and Philippines appear to have a longer horizon of around 20 uh, to uh, 26 to 30 years. Philippines, because of its birth, higher birth rate, et cetera, it's about 40 years. But what is striking here is that the richer countries, France had 115 years to go from an easing to an aged society, right? UK had more than 50 years. Sweden had almost 80 years. So there's something very different at work, which is, uh, showing us that uh, if we can leverage this window, this demographic window, if we invest in our peoples, if we mobilize all the talent and the energy and the potentials of our young people, then you can make this leapfrog from a lower to a higher uh, level of development within the same window. We don't have the longer uh, you know, uh, demographic horizon that many of the richer countries have, but, but conditional on we making the investment and we organizing, exerting, acting, as young people, we have that, uh, that uh, possibility. So the, if you flip the demographic uh, data, it becomes a much more urgent call for action. So this is one point I would like to uh, make. 
Uh, on engaging the youth uh, in the affairs of our countries and our societies, I think there's the process part and there's the content part. On process, um, you know, in countries where you have the opportunity to do so, especially after you are 18 or so, vote, uh, you know, effect change through that, you organize, exert, act, as I mentioned earlier. In countries where you may not have an opportunity to vote directly, there will be avenues uh, to participate on the civic space and channel your voices uh, upwards. And we've seen this in, in many countries of our region where uh, you know, you may not have a conventional multi-party democracy, uh, but there are other uh, spaces where, where you can affect uh, action. But I love this point that, uh, that uh, Kani made, for example, that not every bright idea that a young person says necessarily translates into uh, a policy position, right? Oftentimes, these things have to be filtered, vetted for their feasibility. Now, you know, what adults come in and say are as concrete walls, hard walls, may not be there. These need to be broken, often challenged, the conventions, et cetera. But we do need to uh, look at the feasibility part. You know, if you ask a young person and say, everybody in the world, 8 billion people in the world need to get a median global income, let's say $10,000 per year. Well, that's already $800 trillion. What is the global GDP right now? $100 trillion only, right? So, you know, these things have to pass through that feasibility uh, filter. And that's very important where you, when you have a two-way dialogue. Uh, with uh, with uh, with policymakers uh, and all that. Now, let me end with uh, basically what I heard from you today are the three areas where uh, young people uh, want uh, change. One is, and I would recast that in the language that we speak in the UN and particularly at UNDP, is this un, you know realizing human development potential. So this is about learning skills. Uh, you know. Uh, working, the, the future of work that we've been talking about, this is where the digital, digital uh, possibilities come in, et cetera. So the realizing human potentials in terms of human development, right? The flourishing uh, expansion of choices, uh, freedoms, et cetera. The second is on climate change. And this is where we are at this greater reckoning uh, of the planet in peril, et cetera. The, the, uh, the IPCC report that came out that Kani referred to, I would urge everyone to read it. It's the, the, there's a 40 page summary for policymakers. It's striking. And, and, and that should really mobilize us all into action. And finally, inclusive societies where you have greater respect for you know, tolerance, peace, uh, human dignity, uh, human security, and all that. So I think the first is sort of the economic slant, the second is on the environmental, and the third is on the social. So if we, if we do greater justice uh, to these higher aspirations, we are also in the process uh, honoring a lot of the SDGs around which the world has already uh, coalesced. So thank you again. It was wonderful to engage with you, listen to your voices. Uh, and I hope uh, you know, many of the consultative inputs that you provided will get re reflected in the regional program uh, documents and in the country uh, program documents that uh, many of you are part of in, in the Asia Pacific region. And again, we hope this is not a one-off exercise and we'll be able to uh, engage with you on a sustained basis. So let me close there. Thank you, Arati. Thank you so much, uh, Swarnim. Um, and uh, fantastic points, particularly your point on, you know, making sure our, we, we are all turning up in our civic spaces, turning up to vote, turning up to engage if we want to enact change. Um, Kani has had to drop off um, and uh, to, to deal with more Afghanistan issues and has said thank you so much to everybody for your insightful questions and probing and holding us all to account um, and has you know, again passed on her congratulations to the organizing team. I just wanted to step in very quickly to say a lot of the you know what we learned from the from the world we want consultations also resonated with the inputs coming out from other stakeholders so alignment was definitely there which substantiated the demands uh, from young people and that's going to be reflected in our regional strategy as um, yes you will see it over the next couple of months um i'm going to hand over to din long now to to wind up but i just wanted to end with this um engagement of young people is cannot and should not end must never be tokenistic. It must never end up being a line in a document. We are accountable today. We are accountable to, to our future generations. And one of the questions we, we want to talk about what inspires all of us, the things that I, the value that I live a lot in my life and which I would encourage us to also think about when we are making decisions about how to engage, how to design policy, how to design strategies, is what kind of ancestors do we want to be? 
What kind of world do we want to live, leave behind for our children, our grandchildren, and our future generations? On that, thank you so much, everybody, for your incredible engagement. Thank you to Swarnam and to Kani for taking out time in an incredibly busy, uh, stressful week to join us here today. Uh, Dinlong, back to you. Thank you so much, Arati and Swarnam and everyone. So we are approaching our final two minutes of this call. Uh, but just to say, if you have to remember uh, two things, and while I'm sharing that, please turn on the video. Take the small uh, sentence that you had on paper, if you have it as well, to prepare for the group picture. But yes, there's two things to remember. First one is we hope that, yes, you, you are more optimistic after this uh, session, a bit like what you experience after the World We Want consultations. And yeah, remember the word inclusion, empathy, identity. I think that the keywords of today, and maybe on more an inspiring and logistical note, you will all receive the recording after this call by email, and also a quick survey to maybe provide some feedback. What are some of your aha moments from the session? And also, if there is any questions that you uh, you couldn't manage to ask. It's the uh, best place uh, so you can share with us. We will consolidate everything and send back again to you. So I think it will be the most challenging group picture I will ever take in my life. There's a lot of, a lot of pages. Uh, but please, yes, turn on the video. And uh, what we always do in Movers program is there are three poses. So you can either do the Korean heart, everyone, if you are a fan of K-pop and K-drama, you can do a medium-sized heart. Let's say it's a, a Vietnamese heart. I like to say that. Or if you're a bit tired, you can stretch and do the very, very big heart to everyone. Uh, it's pretty good at the end of the day to prepare for the Friday. So please choose your side. And I will count to three. There are a lot of pages so please just hold your smile for for like 10 seconds and i will take uh, as many pictures as i can so i will count to three uh, so hold your pose okay one two three and keep it for a few seconds please i see a lot of super beautiful faces okay i'm i continue okay five more seconds Two more seconds. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely Thursday. You'll receive everything by email. Thank you so much again. And see you soon. Now we can all unmute so we can even say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so how can I come in? Thank you, everyone. Mercy. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. And soon WhatsApp group will be established, guys. So be updated to everyone. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um excuse me.